Right now, it's in the left is is more sensorial, but that's because they are the group in power. And in the past, they weren't the group in power. And, and so the right censored more and the left saw this as the victims. And now that they see themselves as victims who have power, they utilize it. And then what I was am seeing on the right spectrum, which I spent a lot of time with, is that they see themselves as victims. And in some ways they are. Uh, it's legitimate, but they are developing that kind of mentality and they want to use the same tools for their own means. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Dom. My guest is Catherine Brodsky. She is a commentator and a writer and a podcaster, of course, who covers cultural issues, the arts, tech, and recently the emerging discussions around free speech and censorship and all of that. I say emerging because even though that's been going on for a while, Catherine is an example of what I like to think of as heterodoxy 2.0. She writes about cancel culture. She has a new book about it, but she's not an ideologue at all. She was born in the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. She later immigrated with her family to Israel and then to Canada. And because of that, she is really sensitive to creeping authoritarianism from the left and the right and is committed to calling it out and fighting it without descending into grievance politics. And even though she has her own cancellation story, she is mostly interested in telling the stories of others who've fallen prey to the mob. And she does that in her new book, No Apologies. This is a great conversation. We talk about many of the people she interviewed for the book, and that includes Katie Herzog, Winston Marshall, Stephen Elliott, Peter Bogosian, and several others. And we really try to get at how to move this anti-cancel conversation in a more positive direction. Now, if you're hearing this right now, that means you are not yet a paying subscriber to The Unspeakable. So you're going to hear about the first 45 minutes of the conversation. There's another 45 minutes beyond that, which is really good. So go to megandom.substack.com and become a paying subscriber. If you are a paying subscriber and you're hearing this, you need to fix your RSS feed setting. We have a detailed post, including a helpful instructional video on the Substack. So just go there and take care of that. In the meantime, here is the first half of my conversation with Catherine Brodsky. Catherine Brodsky, welcome to The Unspeakable. Thank you for having me. What a great title, by the way. Thank you. It's, um, Am I it's allowed to the... say it because it's unspeakable? I just yeah, told I you a dad joke. Way a way to start. Uh, it sounds a little, I know it sounds a little edgelordy. The fact is it's named after my book, The Unspeakable, which came out oh. in 2014 and was really had nothing to do with the culture wars whatsoever. So you're here to talk about No Apologies. This is your book, No Apologies, How to Find and Free Your Voice in the Age of Outrage, Lessons for the Silenced Majority. I really love this book. So the term cancel culture, uh, I'm sure you would agree, has been diluted and and misapplied. Yes. That said, it, it very much exists in the pantheon of cancellation stories. You've done something smart here in that after telling your own story, you devote your chapters to individual case studies about people's cancellations. So I want to go through some of those, but let's start by hearing your story. How did you find your way into this world? Sure. For me, how I sort of found my way into this ecosystem was partially accidental, partially, I think, in the making as I sort of reflect on it more. I was somebody who's pretty, you know, I'm appeasing and um, <laughs> I, I wasn't somebody who's like a, a massive contrarian, but I definitely have some thoughts that are contrarian. And even though I liked to get along with people, I also was somebody who, if things didn't kind of add up, I don't mind saying it out loud. But there is a level of self-censorship and self-silencing that I still executed on, especially being, you know, I worked in the film industry a lot, in the media industry a lot. So, you know, those there's kind of um, a consensus culture in there. And I don't think people actually have a consensus. 
It's just that they're afraid to voice different perspectives. So what generation are you? Like what what time period were you growing up in and what was the sort of mentality around free speech? So I was born in the Soviet Union, as I'm sure you've gathered from my book. And so, you know, it was still the communism era when my family left. And so things like freedom of speech were actually really, really important values for me and for my family because they didn't have freedom of speech there. And that was something that we really appreciated about the West. But also, you know, I grew up in a very liberal environment. My faculty in my university, you know, I studied communications and that was the most sort of left-leaning you can get in the at the university, I think. And it was... At the same time, the value, the fundamental value of freedom of speech, freedom of thought and expression was actually something that was a value that was held very carefully and deeply and taught to us. So it was sort of surprising to see how things suddenly shifted. And I guess it wasn't so sudden, but it was a slow change, but it felt sudden in some ways. It it felt like things really accelerated in the last, you know, maybe six years or so. And I started seeing these things, but I didn't, you know, I would speak about them here and there, but I I had no public voice. And the writing that I did, which was for very sort of mainstream publications, uh, wrote, I was a stringer, still like SM, for Variety for about 12 years. And I've written for the Washington Post and The Guardian and Newsweek and Wired and things like that. But I was writing mostly on things like film, television, doing a lot of interviews, technology, things like that. So I didn't have to encounter anything that had to do with my personal opinion on things. I was a very kind of, I held the value of being an objective reporter pretty close to my heart or what's meant to be there. (laughs) Like a lot of people, you first stumbled into a cancellation event via Facebook. (laughs) I I often joke that uh, people find their way to uh, me, especially so I have, uh, my my listeners know I have this enterprise called the Unspeakeasy, which is a free speech community for, for women in particular. And we talk about uh, these things. And I always say that there's usually one of two things that bring women to the Unspeakeasy. And that is a Facebook incident or a book club incident. So <laughs> you had a Facebook incident. Tell us what happened. Yeah. So I had this group that I ran on Facebook and it was an offshoot of another group, which I guess originally you weren't supposed to talk about it, but I think enough people talked about it that I can name it, which is the binders. Um, uh, that was sort of the, the main name of the group. And I did an offshoot of that group, which was meant just for jobs. All it was is job opportunities for women. Okay. And we should say, so binders, God, it was that was huge. I mean, that just had so many tentacles because Lee Stein has yeah. been on this podcast talking about her involvement with uh, with Binder and Bindercom. So we should say that the Binder sort of Facebook franchise came out of Mitt Romney saying that he he was looking at you know any number of women that could be cabinet members if he were elected president, et cetera, and that he had binders full of them, you know, full of their resumes that he was considering, right? Okay, so this kind of got taken on. This was, of course, mocked, and this was mm-hmm. reclaimed by the sort of feminist blogosphere, and out of this emerged the binders groups on Facebook, which were designed for networking opportunities for women. Is that an accurate description? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's an accurate description. There's so many offshoots of it. So there's the main group and it's quite a large group. And then there's other groups that, you know, dedicated to travel journalism or just, or science journalism or just freelancing. So all sorts of things. And it it was a good resource for the people who were in the group, but also there was so much drama, like the one you mentioned with Lee, there's just the number of stories are kind of endless, which is something I found out after my own experience. I wasn't quite so privy to the drama. And in general, you know, I'd see, you know, you'd see people be sort of reprimanded for microaggressions and things like that. So I was seeing that sneak into the culture. And honestly, I didn't think it was such a big thing at the time. And I didn't like to get involved in sort of little Twitter dispute or sorry, Facebook disputes, social media disputes, because I didn't really see the point of it. 
But what happened with my group, so my group had about 30,000 members, you know, because people like jobs. (laughs) So, and it was a pretty popular group. It never really had any drama up until that point. And it was even, I had a mentorship program in it that was mentioned in the New York Times and all sorts of things. And it gave a lot of people work opportunities. And then somebody had the, you know, quote unquote, audacity to post a job at um, Fox News. And she was even really apologetic about how she posted it. She's like, you know, we're trying to change the culture, increase diversity. So it was very kind of apologetic even in how she approached it. And it was a job (laughs) opportunity. That's always good. You know, if you're trying to recruit, you should apologize on behalf of your company before you- That's right. That's right. For candidates. Well, and I imagine that was like a sign of weakness for the vultures in the group. And so they started really a pylon and really personally attacking her in really, really horrible, despicable ways. And frankly, I didn't think much beyond, well, that's not right. That's not okay to attack a person. So I made a post, which I describe as sort of being a kumbaya kind of post where I wrote, hey, Let's not let's not do personal attacks on each other and let's stay away from politics. And listen, we've come so far apart in the last few years. Let's just come together. And as I tell a story now to people, their reaction, they're like, they know what's coming next. But I swear I did not know what was gonna come next. I think I was quite innocent of the whole minefield at the time. And of course, what happened next was, you know, I was called a white supremacist, KKK adjacent, that I would just as soon hide, you know, <laughs> okay, let the, the KKK This became racial very quickly. So, I mean, was was, was yes. the racial component like the, the sort of salient factor here? I mean, there wasn't really, I mean, the way that people tied it into racism, yes, but their yeah. factor is not the right word. Was it, was it the, the, so, but that was the thing that caught fire because I mean, it wasn't just sort of like, oh, you're, you're a Trumper. What year was this, by the way? It was 2021. Okay. okay. And yeah. And I, yeah, I wasn't a Trumper. I mean, I think it was, it's easier to attack someone who seems like they're from the same tribe. So, because they, you know, somebody who doesn't care about being called a racist or, you know, right winger or any of those things like that. If they're right wing, why would they care? So I think these attacks are actually often against people who are on the same political spectrum, which was my case. And the idea for them was that Fox is, you know, um, white supremacist entity. I'm not a fan of Fox, by the way, but people can decide for themselves whether they want to work for it, whether they, they want to listen to it. Like, that's up to them. I don't make those decisions for other people. But immediately, this was like my endorsement because I'm not letting somebody attack another person. It was like an endorsement of Fox. And that, hence, all these horrible values that come with Fox. But yeah, they made it. Well, what it, they did is they made me, you know, a white supremacist. Which is kind of interesting because, yeah, most of my family was murdered in the heads of, um, you know, certain group of white supremacists called the Nazis. But I think it's irrelevant, you know, whether I'm white or not, because I don't think that attack made sense. But it's interesting because at the time, you know, you, when so many people come after you, you think about it and you think, you know, do they have a point? Have I done something wrong here? Am I wrong? And I'm somebody who has a lot of self-doubt generally. So that's what was going on through my head. And then I looked at the behavior of the people and I saw, I'm like, look, if I disagreed with myself, would I, would I behave this way? Never. I would never do any of these things. Because what happened was, so They also said that you can't take politics out because this is a group for women, so it's inherently political. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And (laughs) the personal is the political. That's the worst. I think that's the worst uh, euphemism that has uh, ever come around. It's It's definitely high on the list. Yeah. And I have to say, at this point, I did knowingly do say a little bit of an FU to them, which was, okay, then I'll open the group up to men. <laughs> That's when that <laughs> really went wild. I, you know, I got, so I would get things like, I would get 
lynch mob photos with like, you know, with fire torches sent to me in DMs. I would get, you know, people were attempting to dox me. I had all my content that was available online was downvoted with, you know, mean comments on social media that attacked me. They send me letters, DMs, just really bad like kind of vile things. And then also they were threatening. They said, you know, we have long memories in the industry. You'll never work again. And so there were all these kinds of direct threats and they were trying to reach out to my editors if they could figure out who to reach out to because then maybe they'd be busy working. But anyways, (laughs) so these are people who are trying to get jobs in journalism. Yes. Did you know who they were? Could you be anonymous in this group? Uh, No, most people, I mean... Yeah, most people were using their own name just because Facebook, uh, I think generally, you know, not a lot of anonymous people on Facebook. So most people, and to join, you had to sort of disclose your writing. And were you hearing from people in the back channels supporting you silently? Yes. Yeah. So that was happening. And that, that was really a big turnaround for me. So I think honestly, at the time where I was emotionally, maybe I would have just sort of gone quiet for a while and people have short memories. And I think that was actually a valid option in terms of like outcome. I actually don't think I would have suffered massive consequences had I stayed silent. But I think what was happening, I would get messages from people who were also in the group, a lot of minorities, by the way. And a lot of them would say, hey, you see what's happening to you? It's wrong. And I feel so ashamed because I'm too scared to speak. And I got a lot of that message. I got so many variations of that message from so many people. I also got some messages from people who wanted to support me. But again, they were really scared. And the other messages that I get are personal stories from people where they shared things that happened to them, either through the same group, same people, or similar situations, people who lost their jobs, were silenced, people who left journalism because they just couldn't based on the abuse. And there was like a lot of these stories. And those are, by the way, the stories that you don't hear of because they don't really resolve well. I think a lot of times people dismiss the idea of, of cancel culture because they see certain people developing a voice. You know, I develop more of a voice other people have as well. But those are the people you hear from. You don't hear the stories of the people who, you know, were effectively silenced and never got their voice back. A lot of people ended up having to change occupations, are making very little money, can't do the thing they love. That's a story that's not often told. And how do you even find these people, right? Yeah, well, exactly. It's like, there's like a logical fallacy here because I hear that all the time. Oh, cancel culture. You know, look at all these comedians. They just came back even stronger. Uh, You know, it always works out. Now it's become a cottage industry. People want to get canceled because it's great publicity, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, well, yeah, for every public figure that you hear of who's been quote unquote canceled, there are a thousand, many thousands of ordinary people who have had the same thing happen and you don't know about it because they've been canceled. That's what that means. Exactly. And they're either canceled or the reason I use silencing so much in the book, a lot of people are silenced. They can't be themselves. And by the way, these are not people, I mean, we're not talking about people wanting to use the N word or as people like to, I don't know why people like to bring this out. I'm like, I don't know anybody who's like upset that they can't use the N word. I don't think I've ever said the N word in my whole life, by the way. It severely impacts your quality of life if you can't use the N word, don't don't you know? Yeah, yeah, right. But it's, but it is about, being able to actually discuss ideas or express or hi who you are, you know. Look, I it's it was easier for me to be in some of these groups because I wasn't a conservative, but I can't even imagine if I was and I'm like work, working in the film industry. I know people who are and they hide it because they're so scared of how you know, people will perceive them, they'll isolate them. I mean, the conversations that people will have, it's it's sort of assumed that you're not a conservative if you're if you're working in the industry. And it's not necessarily true, but it is assumed. So everybody sort of talks to you like that. I find that interesting, but I, I think a lot of people just get silenced either because of the political ideology or just thoughts. I mean, people can't freely talk about all sorts of things that 
even just people on the left have different ideas that there's, it's just, it's not a monolith. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I say this again and again, it's like, you know, I, for one, and I think many people got into these culture businesses because we're interested in ideas. That was the whole point. You know, you, you went into the publishing business or the film business or academia because you loved to talk about things and you enjoyed disagreeing and you wanted to expand your thoughts and you know, hash stuff out with other people. And it's it's really so heartbreaking. The idea that people would remain silent because they are afraid of the judgment of other people who are themselves remaining silent. I mean, t- talk about a exactly. self-fulfilling prophecy. Because I found that when I, absolutely, because when I started speaking more authentically to people around me, I found that a lot of people actually agreed with me. So w- there was a big, a bit of a consensus, but people assumed that others thought the opposite. And it's so, sort of so interesting. And now also people, because they've seen me express myself publicly, you know, people that know me in my real life often approach me to talk to me about things that they don't feel comfortable talking to other people about. And it's really, it's been surprising to learn what the different points of views of people are. And it's like, we really didn't know each other. We were in a way strangers to each other. And you can't have a relationship with someone if you're strangers, if you don't know what you actually think, if you don't feel comfortable saying. And and this is what I noticed like with my closest friends, I never have a fear of offending them or them thinking something really terrible of me because of something I say, because they understand me And they know that even if I say something they disagree with, maybe I say something stupid, maybe I say something even racist, I don't know, that could happen. But they know where I come from and they understand my intentions and they can give me feedback, but they're not going to think I'm a bad person. But we have a world that, you know, you fear that they're going to think you're a bad person. That's what we live in. Let's talk about the stories in the book. You have 16 chapters they tell a story of a particular person who's gone through something like this. There's a big range. We don't have time to go through all of them, but let's just start. Actually, the first one is pretty remarkable. This is uh, <laughs> this has to do with uh, <laughs> what you call knitting. the great unraveling, uh, the knitting, <laughs> the uh, the big trouble uh, in in the knitting world. Um, this is a, a woman named um, what is her name? Uh, Maria Tuscan. Tell yes. us what happened to her. Yeah, this was interesting because who would have thought the dating community would have such a bizarre... (laughs) Well, they do have needles. They do have, you know, weapons. That's right. They're really stabby. Backstabby, I guess. Yes. I saw a lot of parallels with... I think part of why I put that story in first is I saw a lot of parallels with my own story in hers. So her story was basically she was in the... she, She had yarns and she was in the knitting community. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a knitting (laughs) community, I'll be honest. And she was somebody who, you know, one day there was a woman in the knitting community who made a post about going to India. And she basically said it was like, like going to a different planet. And honestly, to me, it sounds like, okay, it's an exciting new world. Anytime I travel anywhere, I feel that way. But that's not how other people felt. And they immediately attacked her for being racist. And it was just this huge pylon that was happening. And in fact, that woman apologized. But meanwhile, Maria actually made a video and she stood up for her saying, you know, this is, this is, this pylon is wrong. And this is not, you know, she's not being racist and, and this kind of behavior isn't right. And as a result of that, the mob now turned onto her. And for her, it was just, you know, it wasn't bravery. It was just a matter of like, well, how could I not do that when I see that happening to another person? And as a result, you know, in the knitting community, apparently there's knitting influencers and you need to have relationships with influencers. And people started turning their backs on her while some privately would tell her, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. You're not wrong. Other people would, you know, they wouldn't come out publicly. And meanwhile, other people would be attacking her, really hurt her business. It, it really got sort of downvoted, if you will. And in the end, well, 
I won't, I won't spoil uh, <laughs> the, the rest of the story, but this was something that was just such an example of, of the mob and also of communities and how toxic a lot of communities can get because they don't have this sort of a perception of uh, openness and, and tolerance towards different ideas. And also how quickly, you know, once a few people attack somebody, suddenly everybody jo joins in on the pylon and it has really terrible consequences. Yeah, before we unpack this one further, I actually want to slide into the next story a little bit here because I think that there are some there's some overlapping themes. So the, the second yes. story is Kat Rosenfield, um, also a friend of this podcast, wonderful cultural critic. She had uh, been sort of part of the young adult fiction world. She wrote a couple YA novels herself. And then that had a, a similar kind of implosion. Do you want to tell us what happened there? Sure. It was also part, she was also part of the binders as it happens in the YA. Do you say YA or yeah? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what you say in yeah. Canada, but uh, we say w w YA. Yeah, I'll adult. keep it to that. I don't know what you we guys say. In say yeah, either. you say a all the time. No, but. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't usually. You know, there's some things like you read them. Oh, and you just you never read really have a reason to talk oh, about that's them. That's funny. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. No, it's y uh, YA. Yes, YA. So she's in the YA side of things, and Cat uh, was somebody who's. He's a really interesting writer because she she really is good at sort of capturing things like an outsider looking in and cultural phenomenons. But in her case, she was seeing basically different authors going. Um, oh, somebody was being accused of being. See, you you've probably read the book more recently than I have. <laughs> but she basically was. There was somebody who was being accused of. Uh, it was an author who was accused that their book had racism in it and they were trying to get that book pulled from and publication And the book had, had the book not come out yet was this a good read no. related thing okay yeah, it no hadn't the book was come out. out yet oh it had not come it out it wasn't yet. out right. so not yeah come so what out. happens so they wanted it to be pulled for edits that's what the thing for, so they wanted for the book sort to be of pulled sensitivity for sensitivity kind of edit okay yeah, yeah. But the idea was what they were discussing as their main plan was, well, we'll say that, but really, you know, then the book pretty much, we freak out the publisher and the publisher just doesn't end up publishing the book. That was the intent. And so she then, without really naming names or the book, she she posted about that on Twitter and people got really upset, started attacking her. And then they blamed her for having this sock puppet account on Twitter that was posting racist things, <laughs> which was not her account. Right, right. And again, it was this pylon, let's cancel you, destroy your life for things that aren't even true. So it's just such a pattern because again, it's, it's this kind of toxic community aspect. In fact, actually, those two chapters, I originally had them sort of tied in together because that, that was such a common theme of what happens to these communities. And, and there's sort of this sense, there's the bullies that run those communities, and they run those communities successfully because people are too afraid to say what they actually think and stand up to them. Yeah, and as I was reading you know, the, the YA chapter, it occurred to me, these people are acting like teenagers. This is a genre that is ostensibly for teenagers. I know a lot of adults read YA <laughs> fiction now. That's part of the reason it's exploded. I mean, it's a hugely popular genre because a lot of adults yeah. are reading it. But, you know, be that as it may, it, it, this is for teenagers. Um, and you have people are who are literally just reenacting the, you know, schoolyard kind of mean girl politics of of middle school. And it's pretty astonishing to see. And and I wonder, like, what was the demographic of the of the people in the knitting community, for instance? I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong. I'm assuming a lot of them are women, perhaps most of yes. them. Yes. Let's talk about about that because this is I am very interested in this aspect of of the culture war stuff. Like, how much of this is sort of spearheaded by women? What is it like when women get caught up in this? Is there a different kind of dynamic that that plays out? I wonder like how much thinking you've done about that. Yeah, no, those are really uh, good questions. I do think that 
it's bigger with women. I think it happens more with women. I think people don't quite grow up, as I've realized. You know, you used to think that people become adults, but they don't. And I think, you know, as far as I had been thinking about that, why does that type of bullying happen more with women? I think it it's the nature of our dynamics where men can be more physically aggressive and women tend to be more, you know, abusive and, and sort of the bullying and mean kind of mean girl kind of ways. Right. Because social that's their exclusion. Tool. Yeah. 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 Social exclusion. It's massive, but it's not to say that men don't participate because they do, but it's a bit, it's a bit different. And I do see that kind of, you know, community exclusion, mean girl thing definitely is much more common, I think, amongst women in, in the stories that I've heard. Um, there's just a more of a tendency to, there's, there's just some more jealousy. I've noticed that with women too, like they compete with each other a lot more then I've noticed like men are not going to, like if you bring another man on or two men, I'm not saying they're not going to compete with each other, but people don't view them as sort of a replacement. I th I'm thinking about it in terms of something where it happened to me where I came into a group and one of the members of the group was sort of being a little bit definitely started to get excluded, but it was in a professional setting. So they just didn't like the person. But the perception of it was that I was replacing her. But meanwhile, two other team members were brought in that were male. And there wasn't the same perception of them replacing her. So I was replacing her solely due to my gender. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. And there's just much more of a tendency to compare women together and pit them against each other. So I think it's a little bit of also le uh, leftover from you know, feminism and when women didn't have the equal opportunities and all right. that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I think that there's a feminist interpretation of this that's pretty legitimate. There's a there's yes. a scarcity, there's a scarcity complex that goes yes. on among women. And also we just we don't fight with our fists. We fight with, you know, our well it's our a tool of power, and, right? That's what it is. And gossip is so huge. I mean, but people, I mean, I had somebody accuse me <laughs> of Something that it wasn't even, you know, often these things are just misinterpretations or things like that. In, in this case, the person made everything up. And this was also within a group. Now, that group was more, it was male and female. And yet, and she, you know, started this whole attack. And this whole thing started because of a perceived microaggression, which was for, my, for me, which was me not being able to pronounce her name correctly, <laughs> which is like, okay, you know, I can't, I, I literally have a little bit of a speech impairment. There's some things I have, I struggle with saying certain words. I also have very bad memory for names. I had nothing to do with her, but you know, she the, personalizes it that way. But she then, yeah, she started spreading this fake thing. And it was very sad to see how many people actually isolated me from a professional community as a result of that. There were a few people who, you know, stood up for me and took my side of the, uh, took my side and heard my story. But there's a lot of people who didn't. And some of them pretended after that like, nothing ever happened. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a common favors. theme. I notice that that comes up a lot in these stories. The, the yes. people that you write about will then confront some of their their can counselors after the fact, and the person is like, "I don't know what you mean. I don't even remember that incident." <laughs> it's, like, it's fascinating. I mean, I I didn't realize it until I started seeing the pattern as I was interviewing people. I was like, "Oh, that's interesting that this keeps happening." Yeah, yeah, and I, I want to touch on maybe the degree to which. There are personality disorders, uh, people who are drawn into this who maybe have like, I don't know what we're now calling cluster B that is, you know, whatever, yes. however that is defined. Narcissism. Narcissism, borderline, that kind of thing. But before we get to that, let's talk about a couple more examples because now you do have some men. There's a guy named Daryl Davis. There's the case of Stephen Elliott. There's the case of Peter Bogosian. Uh, so maybe just um, sort of sort of talk about these guys in, in whatever order you want to. Yeah, you see, men are not excluded um, at all. No, there's I mean, a lot of Darryl men Dave, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of men targeted by these uh, mobs as well. And, and those are not mobs consisting of purely women. But, you know, Daryl Davis was always such an inspiration to me in general because he's somebody, 
you know, I, I think you get into a lot of trouble if you associate with the quote unquote wrong people. And it's interesting to me that he is somebody who was in the civil rights movement, is 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 African American or black, whatever you want to call it. He's somebody who experienced massive racism, d- you know, discrimination that was legal discrimination. And yet he talked to members of the KKK. And some of them, as a result of these conversations, had actually ended up leaving the Klan and giving him his their hoods. So he has a hood collection, which is fascinating. And even him, at some point, you know, I think Antifa sort of called him a white supremacist. So I guess no one's safe. <laughs> this reminds me of the, um, is it the Dave Chappelle sketch about uh, the black white, the black white supremacist, Clayton Bigsby, the uh, the black KKK. He's a blind, he plays a, a blind black guy who's a member of the KKK because he doesn't realize he's black. It's a brilliant <laughs> oh. sketch. Anyway, Oh, that's sorry. funny. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds really funny. <laughs> but yeah, I, I highly recommend. Well, what period of time are we talking about with Daryl Davis? Is this fairly recent? This was recent for him, yeah. Because I think the tide has really changed, right? I, I, I think a lot of the things we, me and you, might talk about now are things that were like normal things to talk about. Because I was going to say, I mean, if this were the 60s and the 70s, th- this is kind of like standard activist practice in a way. Yeah, absolutely. So I found I find it really fascinating that we've sort of shifted here. And then you've got people so so another man in my in my book is so um Stephen Elliott, he had a lot of impact on my thinking on this particular topic because he's somebody who was put into the am I allowed to say the word <laughs> shitty men, oh, shitty me- media men. Yeah, and Stephen yeah. Elliott has been on this podcast telling this story. So some of our listeners may oh, be great. familiar. It was a couple of years ago now, but yeah, yes, we're allowed to say shitty media men list. Yes. Okay, because that's the list he was put on, and it was a list of anonymous accusations. And he was accused of, you know, something really heinous, which is rape. You know, something that he's innocent of, but was accused of and it destroyed his life and also fighting back destroyed his life. But I remember when that list came out and this was in the height of the Me Too movement, I was mixed about that list. And let's let's remind people what it is just real quick. It was a Google Doc. Yeah, it was a Google Doc that was naming people in media who were abusive to women. So it was kind of like a whisper network. But the problem with that list, it wasn't just, uh, you know, one woman warning and another woman based on an experience she had. It was published and made public. So that list as a result of it being made public destroyed a lot of lives. And I'm sure that some people on that list were sort of rightfully accused and probably were guilty. And some people were likely innocent. So the problem with it is that it was it was all anonymous accusations. But when that list came my way, you know, I, was, I wasn't sure about it because on the one hand, well, shouldn't you warn other women if they're in danger? And on the other hand, I, I did understand there's probably exaggerations or false stories on that list. So I was really mixed up. And then I heard Stephen Elliott tell his own story it, back in the clubhouse days. Somebody did a, a, a space, uh, a, a room stage with him, whatever. And listening to him tell it, really shifted my point of view on this because it's the idea of like, do we get the guilty and the price are innocent people get caught in this? Or do we protect the innocent, but some guilty people go free? Yeah. We should say also about this list that it it was a range of offenses. Like it went anywhere from rape to weird at lunch. Or slipping yes. into your DMs, right? So, yeah. or just, you know, being slightly creepy, somebody's interpretation of it. So, yeah. This well, this was- is a general problem, I think, because I, I can understand, like, I'm not against any repercussions for any speech or any action. I, I think there is um, a level of repercussion <laughs> that is earned. But the problem that we have as a society is that, yeah, you you have somebody sending a creepy email or looking you kind of weird at lunch and their life is over 
in the same way that somebody who's accused of rape <laughs> or convicted of rape, you know? So those are very, that's the problem that I see. Somebody saying something a little bit off color, you know, can lose everything in the same way that somebody who actually commits an action uh, that's, you know, actually hurts somebody. Yeah. And, and I mean, what must that feel like if you are a survivor of rape to have your experience just lumped in with somebody feeling un- uncomfortable at lunch? It just seems Great profoundly yes. offensive. It is. So, it is yeah, profoundly and in, offensive. And in Stephen's case, you know, he's a he's a complicated figure, but he he had been a sex worker himself. And so part of the reason he was able to say, I definitely never raped anybody was just, you know, the nature of his sexuality is that he doesn't have penetrative sex. I, I thought was actually, and, you know, he talks about this in, in the chapter. I, I thought was like really fascinating about that is he was like, well, you know, a lot of men, if they're accused of rape, even if they th- know or th- even if they are like going around the in life feeling confident that they never raped anybody there's always a chance that they had sex with somebody who misinterpreted it like that is always a possibility and he said i am really the only man probably on this list who can tell you for a fact that i have not had intercourse with a woman and so therefore he ended up filing a lawsuit against uh, Moira Donegan who had you know, started the list and there's a whole story there. But yeah, anyway, his his little, you know, the, the reason that he was able to take that case as far as he did just had to do with this particular quirk of his sexuality. Exactly. And, and most men, you know, that's not the case. But with him, and yet, you know, because in, in particular because of the case, but even was just the accusation. I mean, an accusation of rape, a false accusation, even when you try to correct the you know, with the truth, it's just, it sticks in people's minds. And he became such a pariah. I mean, his life was so destroyed, but he's also somebody, he's like a, he's an artist, right? He's a writer and he's a good writer. He's a very talented writer, kind of an exceptional voice. And you rely on, you know, an industry or a community to create that art, to have people read it, to have people publish yeah. it. And he was a filmmaker too. He did independent and he was a films filmmaker. and th- he's a very, a yeah. very experimental kind of, you know, old school artist. He is. And yet people just turn on him in a way, I mean, his whole life is destroyed. Now he does real estate, I guess. Well, uh, which, you know, he's not he's doing too good. bad. <laughs> Yeah, he, he did a good being, job. If on that's that. being canceled, yeah, there's no such thing as cancel culture. Everybody gets rich in real estate. <laughs> well, but he cannot do the thing that he yeah. was essentially put on earth to do, which I, I've read some of his writing and uh unpublished writing, and and it's like he is a very particular voice, and it's not something that I mean, it makes you think like how many voices like that do we lose? Because either because they self-censor what they really want to say, or people don't publish them, or because something like this happens and that's it, they're gone and they're they didn't do anything wrong. But now there's a loss to them because they can't express themselves the way they want to. And there's a loss to us uh, because we miss their voice from society. And I really hope he's able to sort of come back from that as society, like, you know, as we sort of shift and more opportunities arise for people who aren't in the box. But it is such a shame. Yeah. Although, I mean, I'm thinking about this. You could make the argument that he is still around. He has a sub stack. We're talking about him. Also, a lot of his continued cancellation arguably was because he had filed this lawsuit. Yes. I don't know what would have happened if he had just like kept his head down and hoped that it blew over. So, I mean, I, I, I'm curious, I don't want to get too waylaid here, but I think this is really an important thing to explore. Like, what do you think about the fact that, you know, a lot of these artists and uh, you were in the film industry too. I mean, no matter what your sort of genre is, it is easier than it used to be to get your work out there. You can go on Substack. If you're a filmmaker, you can crowdfund. There are ways around, you know, relying on the old institutions. You know, you may not, you know, Stephen Elliott might not get a big book contract from a major publisher, but he is able to get his voice out there. So like, what do you think about that? 
I have mixed feelings. And the reason I have mixed feelings is that, well, for example, making a movie, yes, you can make a, a movie on a smaller budget these days, but if your vision doesn't align with it, you can't really do what you want to do. Can't tell the story you want to tell. If it comes to writing independently, like I'm in that boat now because I, I struggle now to, to want to write for some of the publications I used to because I know that they won't take the kinds of stories I want to write. And, you know, there is probably, you know, because I've spoken up and have been so public, there is a trail, <laughs> you know, of information about me and my thoughts and not everyone's going to like it. And I'm sure it has affected, you know, whether I hear back from editors or not. Yeah. Although it's hard to know. That's the worst part. Is it's hard going to know. Crazy. You don't know. No, you don't know. I, I've had, you know, I've had a client that was like, loved me, loved me, loved me. And then suddenly they're like, they go silent. And hey, I don't know. Maybe they, there's something else in play but maybe it has to do with my being outspoken. And I don't know. I, and I will probably never know. But I definitely, you know, on the one hand, yeah, you can go to Substack. But I've noticed with the models that you have is that the things that do well are generally whatever is cause-based. So if I, you know, I have a Substack, but it's very modest. And if I were to write things that are more inflammatory, I'd probably have a larger readership and a, in particular, a larger readership that would be willing to pay me money. And that's what I've noticed. If you're just trying to stay away from being kind of audience captured, I think it's a lot harder. I mean, some people have found success, but it is more of an exception. And again, you hear people doing well, but there's so many people who are not, and it's hard to sort of go from, you know, having a job or having a f financial pay versus, you know, what I make in a, a writing one article for a major publication, even when I'm not being paid a fortune, is I make less than that in a month writing my Substack. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And the book publishing thing, it's hard too because there's definitely less of a stigma in self-publishing now than there used to be. I'm glad yeah. to see that, you know, it was, it always did seem a little bit hypocritical, like, you know, it, to be, it, you know, 20 years ago, if you were self-publishing, like that was just, <laughs> that was just for like total amateurs. Like that was, it was just never taken seriously. Whereas if you were like an indie musician or a filmmaker and you made your own film or you put out your own record on your own label, that was cool, right? But somehow there was, there was never the sort of cool factor with self-publishing. And I don't know that it's cool now, but it definitely, you know, it, it's gone into this kind of entrepreneurial space and you're seen as a kind of you know, self-starter and if you do that. But yeah, you're still beholden to an audience and there's just really no, there's no substitute for a major publisher who is going to like get your book out there and, you know, for starters, make sure- Has it is, the deals to get them into stores, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and but before we, before we even get to that, like is edited and copy edited and, yes. you know, it ha, it, there is some accountability there. Yeah, and then gets it into stores and gets it in front of reviewers. And, and Yeah, there's you know, a level of gatekeeping that's not necessarily awful, right? Like no, it gives you a sense of like, okay, it. somebody yes. actually took a gamble on my book, right? Paid me something and right. and and invested in in it and their time and, and energy and trying to get it out. I think it it vets the book in a way. But it's funny, I did have somebody, I had a few people who, as soon as you tell them that you have a book coming out, they're like, oh, is it self-published? I know, I know. <laughs> like, thanks. <laughs> but it's not yeah, an insult. I know. I know, I know. Yeah. Or then you'll be like, no, it's published by a major publisher. And they'll be like, oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I'm so exactly. embarrassed and for you. Like, That's okay. Maybe maybe someday you'll get to self-publishing. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. But like, you know, so in, in the case of, say, Peter Bogosian, so he's the chapter after. That was the first half of my conversation with Catherine Brodsky. If you want to hear the rest, become a paying subscriber at megandom.substack.com, the unspeakable podcast. It's just $7 a month. You get all kinds of great stuff, including my writing, and you get to hear the entire interview every single week. So go there and do that right now. In the meantime, I'll remind you that Catherine Brodsky 
is a commentator and a writer who's contributed to lots of publications, including Newsweek, Variety, Washington Post. She has a podcast, which you can find on her Substack, katherinebrodsky.substack.com, and her book, No Apologies, How to Find and Free Your Voice in the Age of Outrage, Lessons for the Silenced Majority, is out this week. Pub date, January 30th. So go get it. Before I sign off, ever-present reminder that our unspeakeasy retreats for this year are filling up. So if you're on the fence, get off that fence. We are in Austin, March 2nd and 3rd. Sarah Heppola, the writer who's been on this podcast, the author, is one of our guest speakers. The other one is Ariel Isaac Norman, the comedian. So that's Austin. We will be in Louisville on April 9th and 10th with guests Corinna Cohn and Nina Paley of the Heterodorks podcast. We will be in Los Angeles April 20th and 21st. Guest speaker to be announced. Seattle, May 18th and 19th with Katie Herzog from the Blocked and Reported podcast. Toronto, October 5th and 6th with guest speakers Tara Henley of the Lean Out podcast and Phoebe maltz Bovi of Feminine Chaos. Amazing, right? We'll also be in Woodstock at the end of October, and I'm working on the guest speakers for that. As always, go to theunspeakeasy.com to find out more about that and also join our online community. Ladies, like I said, trying to get a co-ed retreat together. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, this is ladies only. Gentlemen, you can rate and review the podcast. That would help me out. Everybody can do that. I always forget to mention it. Rate and review. You know, if you can't become a paying subscriber right now, just uh, leaving a five-star review is almost as good. I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Thanks for listening. See you then. Mm-hmm.